The business of comics is ever changing. Depending on when you watch this, some of the information may no longer be relevant. This is sort of a time capsule, an overview of the business of comics in the year 2020. Now is the best time to make comics. I mean, I kind of think that any time is the best time to make comics, but the new millennium is especially primed for comics creation. No longer do traditional publishers or syndicates serve as gatekeepers to the world of comics. The era of social media has democratized the methods by which creators can reach audiences. No one can stop you from telling your story. Not only are new distribution channels widely available to all creators, methods to create your comics are becoming more and more obtainable. Traditional methods for drawing remain fairly affordable. You don't need the most expensive brushes or papers to make good comics. Should you want to try your hand at digital art, the tools for image creation from drawing tablets to tablet computers are becoming more budget-friendly. There are also very powerful free and cheap drawing programs that digital artists can use to tell their stories. Print is still very much alive in 2020. Mini comics are a great way to jump into print comics without breaking the bank. So to do your mini comics, your first mini comic, you're gonna need a plain piece of paper, pair of scissors. So there's two methods. We're gonna go through the first one, fold lengthwise. And I apologize in advance because the audio quality is not gonna be that great. Uh, so we got our center line, and we fold widthwise. Take this flap, fold back all the way down. Flip it over. So now we have our M shape. And you can also see the center line here. So we're gonna cut the fold. So this is the fold. We're gonna take our scissors and cut along that fold line. This is hard to see. You're not gonna cut all the way, just to the crease. There we go. And then you should have something that looks like a monster. Rawr! Fold over, crease down, and fold. So now you have your first comic. This is your front cover, cover, inside cover, first page, second page, third page, fourth page, letter column, And then back cover. And then when you unfold it, you have your single-sided comic. You can go to any copy shop, run off copies of this, do the folds, do the cut, and mini version number one. Mini version number two requires a lot more cutting and we will need a stapler, which I do not have on hand, but it's a little bit bigger. So you fold this way and then you fold it one more time. And in this instance, you're going to cut your paper in half. So all the way in half. Um, for demonstration purposes, I'm not gonna cut all the way in half, but for you, when you actually do this, you wanna cut all the way in half. So this, this version, you usually print out a cover on heavy cardstock and then fold it all together. Um, but I'll show you what that means in a second. All right, so we go back to our folded down version. And so we have our page one, Page two, three, four, five, 
six, seven, and eight. And when we unfold our piece of paper, this is what the page layout looks like. So you have one, eight, four, five on one side, and on the other side you have two, seven, three, and six. In this case, you're gonna to need to go to a printer that can do both sides. So you run off double-sided prints on this, and then you get your heavy cardstock, cut it in half, and use that for the cover. So two different types of minis. This one requires no stapling. This one requires stapling and an extra cover. I kind of prefer this one just because it's nicer in size and you don't have to squint when you're reading the comic that much. And you have like space for like a good two, three, or four panel layout. This one's a little tiny, but these are easily pocketable. So if you want to just have like a business card situation and just examples of your illustrations in here, this is a good size for, for pocket stuff. This is a little bit bigger, requires a little bit more finesse. Um, I don't know, it's up to you. These are both good options. Minis are fun. Make some minis right now. <laughs> You can head to your local FedEx Kinko's or Staples or similar office supply store to run off copies of your mini. Or, if you have access to an office printer and you're actually able to make it into the office during the pandemic, you could probably run off copies after hours for free. Then you have a stapling party to put them all together and boom, your first print comic. Mini comics are great currency for independent cartoonists. Many comic book shops support their local artist community and will gladly stock your minis on their shelves. You can also take them to comic conventions when they return and trade them with other cartoonists or hand them out to your favorites. The Small Press Expo here in Rockville is particularly friendly to mini comics. Many of the creators there got their start printing their own minis and there's still a great mini trade scene at the show. Minis also make great gifts for holidays or birthdays or other occasions. You may find that minis are your preferred method to tell your stories. But should you wish to move to a more traditional newsstand format, with digital printing services, you no longer have to commit to an expensive 1,200-piece run of a book from an offset printer. The cost per issue of a digital printed run is a lot more than a traditional offset run, so you won't be making all that much of a return in terms of sales. But you can order a run as low as 100 copies, or lower depending on the service, and not fill your basement with boxes of unsold inventory. A digital print run will also get a book into your hands, which is something that you can send out to friends or potential editors or sell at conventions, again, when they eventually return. Additionally, once you've gone through the trouble of putting together a file for a digital print run, you can sell digital copies of your book through services like Gumroad and upload it to digital comics distribution platforms like Comixology, which brings us to digital distribution. Unless you're a web designer, we often don't recognize the complexity involved with sharing images online. From image resolution, to load times, to the disparate manner in which the various flavors of web browser display HTML, to the way graphics are rendered on different operating systems, there is a lot of complexity under the hood of any website that posts images. Social media platforms greatly simplify this process, which makes them perfect delivery systems for comics. And as an added bonus, they are free. There are even sites specifically designed to host comics. Besides being free, platforms like Instagram, Twitter, Tumblr, Webtoon, Tapas, and the like often come with large built-in worldwide user bases, which means more potential viewers for your content than if you were starting out from scratch. You can connect with your audience in a more personal fashion than just a one-time print purchase and build a loyal fan base that will follow your work and share it with their friends. And because these platforms have such a wide reach, you can get pretty niche and granular with your content. If you have a great idea for a comic about a cycling baker, chances are you will find fans of cycling and baking who will relate to your comic. As wonderful as these platforms are, there are some caveats you should absolutely be aware of before you start uploading your comics. If a platform is free, you are the product. Platforms that offer their services for free monetize your work and offer very little in terms of support. Even though Webtoon and Tapas offer revenue sharing for their higher performing comics, they are making more off of your work than you are from the exposure. 
Platforms ultimately have their own interests at heart. They will change algorithms based on internal tracking metrics that they rarely disclose. This means that content that used to gain traction on any given platform may not perform as well when these changes are implemented. Terms of service may evolve and change as platforms respond to internal and external pressures. Sometimes, this means that your content may get pulled off of a service because it now violates a new rule. You are ultimately subject to the whims of your chosen platform. The solution is to build your own website. This way, you get to post whatever you like without having to worry about someone else policing your content. Building your own website requires a lot of back-end work. Fortunately, there are site-building tools that do not require any coding knowledge. You also have to pay for a URL and site hosting, though these days, those fees are pretty affordable. The biggest disadvantage you have when creating your own site is that you'll also have to build your audience from scratch. You'll have to invest in some form of advertising or develop a social media presence to drive traffic to your site. The nice thing is that the people who end up following your site may become loyal customers for your work. So you don't need crazy big traffic numbers to monetize effectively. You just need fans who will actually buy stuff from you. There is no set path to working in comics. Though there are colleges that teach comics and even comics schools, a degree in comics will not guarantee you a job in comics. Breaking into the industry, at least at publishers like Marvel and DC, depends on both perseverance and luck. A survey of 10 different comics professionals will reveal 10 different ways in which they got their first gig. And once you get in, there's no guarantee that you will stay in. However, the world of comics is bigger than just traditional publishers and syndicates. And though there are definitely keepers at the gate who may try to prevent your work from going through those doors, we have many ways to circumvent tradition and reach our readers directly. But before we subvert anything, it's kind of helpful to know the various jobs required to put a book on the shelf. In Western comics, you can be a publisher, an editor, a writer, a penciler, an inker, a colorist, or a letterer. Some of these jobs can be combined, most often on the art side. These days, it's fairly common to have artists who can pencil and ink their own work. Some can even color their own line art. The job of a colorist can further be divided into colorist and flatter. A flatter prepares a page to be rendered by separating objects on the page by flat colors. A colorist uses the flat layer to do their selections and rendering. Sometimes flatters get credit on a book, and sometimes they don't. Projects can either be work-for-hire or creator-owned. Work for hire means that the company owns the rights to any work you create under the contract. That means that if you create a new hero or villain in a particular issue, the company now owns that new character. Writers, pencilers, inkers, colorists, and letterers are paid per page in a work for hire situation. Unless they are a big name, freelancers never see any royalty on their work. Sometimes companies will send artists back their pages so that they can sell them to collectors. And most big publishers turn a blind eye to freelancers selling sketches of their copyrighted characters at conventions. There are creators that are well-known enough that they can command exclusive contracts at a company. But the industry survives on the back of hungry freelancers looking for that next big project that may, and I emphasize may, put them into that exclusive category. Here are some page rates for various jobs in comics, according to a survey conducted by the Graphic Artists Guild in 2017. These ranges include mainstream and independent publishers, so if you notice a huge discrepancy between the low versus the high numbers, that's why. Writing, plot and script, $75 to $120. Painted art, $200 to $750. Pencils, $90 to $400. Inks. 75 to $300. Computer colors, 50 to $150. Computer lettering, 40 to $50. Editors are usually salaried staff. They manage the logistics of putting a book together, hiring freelancers, coordinating between the various members of their team, keeping the team on deadline, and offering feedback to ensure consistent storytelling. Editors manage both work for hire and creator owned projects. In some ways, creator-owned projects can be much more risky than work-for-hire books. For one thing, there's rarely any money up front. 
In fact, there are some companies that may require you to pay to get your book published in the first place. But you retain the rights to your property, and you get paid royalties on the back end as long as your book is in print. This means a recurring revenue stream rather than a project-based one-time payout. And because you retain your rights, you can pitch your property as a TV series or a movie franchise, and you can sell merchandising rights. The possibilities for monetizing intellectual property that you own are endless. Working with a publisher is great for an artist. The company takes care of all the logistics required to get books on shelves like graphic design, page layout, coordinating with the offset printer, packaging, shipping, promotion, and hundreds of little esoteric details that are completely unfamiliar to artists, letting the artists concentrate on what they do best, draw pretty pictures. Landing a gig at or successfully pitching a project to a publisher is not all that straightforward. And after years of rejection, you may start to think that there is no audience for your work. In my biased opinion, that is never true. There's always someone out there that will think your story is the greatest thing that they've ever read. You just have to figure out how to get it to them. To make money with your art, you need to find those fans who will actually buy from you. You don't really need a publisher for that. You can do it yourself. The modern cartoonist must also be a bit of an entrepreneur to make money. Though somewhat counterintuitive, the webcomic model has proven to be successful to varying degrees. Step 1. Put your comics online for free, either on your own site or on a service like Instagram or Twitter or Tumblr or Webtoon or Tapas. Update frequently, either monthly, weekly, or daily, depending on what you can manage to produce. Step 2. Build an audience with free, regular updates. Step 3. Monetize that audience. This can take the form of advertisements or sponsorships on your site, although the ad revenue market is pretty awful these days. A handful of webcomic platforms like Webtoon and Tapas actually pay out depending on how many regular readers you have, but in general, advertising turns out to be a fairly unreliable source if you're looking for a steady income stream. Slightly more dependable than advertising is selling merch based on your art. A number of early web cartoonists in the 2000s made decent livings through t-shirt sales alone. Enamel pins are quite popular these days. Art prints and posters are always good staple products. Commissions can be a decent source of income. Please, 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 if you take commissions, raise your rates. Whatever you're charging now is too low. Yes, even you. Collecting your comics into book form can be a huge personal milestone. Publishing a book yourself is a great accomplishment. Going through all the steps to get the book ready for print may also motivate you to find a publisher who will work with you and do all that stuff so you can concentrate on making comics. As previously mentioned, the nice thing about putting a book together is that it's usually a digital file, which means you can sell digital collections via online marketplaces like Gumroad or submit to digital comics distributors like Comixology. Publishing a book costs money. Fortunately, the new millennium has an answer, crowdfunding. Platforms like Kickstarter and Indiegogo give creators the means to solicit funds to publish their work. To give your book the best chance of successful funding on Kickstarter, you'll need to have your own audience. Kickstarter has great name recognition and a wide funding base, but you'll need your loyal fans to give your project an initial boost so that their algorithm pushes it out to random users searching for comics projects. There are a lot of logistical concerns that go along with running a Kickstarter project. That's probably best for a whole video in and of itself, or a whole series of videos for that matter. Just know that crowdfunding exists and can help you start your own little self-publishing empire. Now that you've made all this groovy merch, where do you sell it? In the era of a global pandemic, you sell online. Pre-COVID-19, comic conventions were a great place to sell merch and meet fans. You could also meet fellow creators and make connections, which sometimes can be more important than just selling things. It is unclear what show attendance will look like post-corona, or which shows will even survive. Merchandise is one obvious way to sell your work, but you can also monetize the process of making your work through patronage services like Coffee and Patreon. 
Basically, you charge patrons a small subscription fee to gain access to your art making process. You can also offer exclusive rewards for your patrons like tutorials or digital wallpapers or limited edition merch like pins or prints or patron only commissions. Some artists are able to make a comfortable living off of patronage. Some artists are able to make a comfortable living through merch sales. The nice thing about all of these models is that you can set up as many revenue streams as you like. There's nothing preventing you from working with a publisher while also selling your own merch on the side, along with setting up a Patreon so your fans can follow along while you work on your next book. As you're developing multiple streams of income, it might also be helpful to look outside the comics industry altogether for visual storytelling opportunities. A number of cartoonists have used their skills to transition to other industries like video game design or storyboarding for television and film or book cover and playing card illustration. It's easy to see how comics relate to the entertainment industry, but businesses beyond entertainment are looking to visual storytelling to help spread their message. Comics can distill complex ideas into stories that general audiences can understand. This makes the medium perfect for customer education. Safety guide pamphlets on airplane flights, assembly instructions for IKEA desks, directions for changing tires, those are all forms of sequential storytelling. Corporate comics aren't just about customer education. Businesses are hiring graphic recorders to take visual notes at corporate retreats, keynote presentations, and panel discussions to keep their employees informed and engaged. This presentation is sort of an example of visual note taking. Now is the perfect time to start making comics. You no longer have to pay homage to traditional gatekeepers to reach an audience. You can develop multiple revenue streams to build a steadyish income. And there are many corporate opportunities for visual storytellers looking to help businesses communicate their ideas. You have stories. It's time to tell them.